two people. Two philosophies. Two choices. One decision. You decide. My name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and now I live here in Pensacola, Florida, and it's a great privilege of mine to be able to defend the Bible against those who believe in the theory of evolution. What you're about to see is one of my debates that I do at various universities on this subject of creation and evolution. I am, without apology, a young earth Bible-believing creation scientist. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, and you will see in this debate, uh, the opposing side, the evolution view, which is currently being taught in our school system, of course, at taxpayers' expense. And I'll be sharing what the Bible teaches in the creation view, how God made the world. Now, if the Bible is correct, and we are created by God, and God is the owner of this world, then we will stand before him someday, and he will be our judge. You need to be prepared for that day. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, be sure to get a hold of me. I'd be glad to share with you what the Bible says about how to be forgiven, how to be saved, and go to heaven. February 9, 1969, I asked the Lord to be my Savior became a member of God's family, and I'd be honored to show you how to do the same. We hope you enjoyed the debate. If this is all you have, you ought to get a list of our other materials. You can contact our office in Pensacola, Florida by email, drdino.com, just drdino.com, or you can call us at 850-479-3466. Thank you. In the middle is Dr. Kent Holband, who has a bachelor's degree in education from Midwestern Baptist College a PhD in education from Patriot University, tells me he was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and basically for a living he is an evangelist and travels around the country and talks about evolution and creation and other interesting topics. To the far right is Dr. Robin Richardson, who has a bachelor's degree in biology from Michigan State, a master's degree in biology from Central Michigan University, and a PhD in zoology from the University of Oklahoma, She's now on faculty here at Winona State after a couple of years at Augusta College in the biology department. And she is an animal behaviorist. As I understand it, she predominantly uh, studies spider behavior. The format this evening will be rather loose. We will begin with each of our panelists giving a 20-minute opening statement. and. Following that, we will immediately go into a question and answer session. I have a couple of questions here now. I encourage you to think of questions as our panelists are speaking and bring those up to me. Even during the middle of the talk, that's fine. I think we'll do better from questions that are stimulated from the discussion rather than questions that people came here already set to ask. My job, of course, will be to keep the it, flow of information going. And with that, I will shut up. I'm told that they have agreed that Dr. Richardson will speak first. What a novel concept. <laughs> I want to wish you all a good evening and thank you for coming to listen to this forum on creation and evolution. When I was asked to do this, I responded with mixed feelings. Most biologists today feel that this issue has been settled for over a hundred years. And I felt that to come here tonight and continue this discussion uh, was really beating a dead horse. As Thomas Huxley said 120 years ago, life is too short to occupy oneself with the slaying of the slain more than once. But now that we're all here, let's first I would like to, to go through how I view this issue. 
I think that this issue is a misunderstanding of the division between various ways that we obtain knowledge about the natural world. I feel that each person should come up with their own view of the natural world, and this view should be a merging of three main areas, philosophy, religion, and science. In philosophy, we ask questions that we can build we can build on premises using the rules of logic. We ask questions like, is the mind separate from the body? We can't answer that question in science. We can't answer that question in religion. We answer that with our philosophy. Conversely, in religion, we answer questions that are based on faith. We answer questions like, is there a God? That question should not be answered by science. Science deals with the material world, the observable material world. Science is further subdivided into physics and chemistry, which are considered the hard sciences, and which are derived from mathematics. When they're derived from mathematics, we can speak of proof. Proofs are mathematical in basis. In physics and chemistry, then, we can talk about laws, laws derived from proofs. In biology and the other sciences, we talk about theories. Theories are the ultimate expression of biology, geology, and of the other sciences. Theories are not weaker than laws. They are still the result of years of research. They are just not mathematical in basis. It is not proper in biology to talk about proof. You can't ask for proof in biology because proof is mathematical in basis. Biology is not mathematical in basis. So those are some of the misconceptions. I think people confuse, blur the lines between their methods of gaining knowledge about the natural world, and they run into confusion. So let's look at some of the sciences and see how those sciences contribute to our knowledge of the natural world and of evolution. First of all, evolution is supported by modern geology and paleontology, two areas that are not overlapping with biology. Historically, geology was dominated by the catastrophists. Catastrophists believe that life existed during periods, and those periods were interrupted by catastrophes. They fell into two schools. The Vulcanists, who think, thought that life was interrupted, or there were periods of extinction brought about by volcanoes, and the Diluvianists, who believed that periods of life were interrupted by floods. The early Diluvianists that looked in the fossil record found four major periods of extinction and they said that there were historically then four floods. The catastrophists were overcome in the 1830s by uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the modern theory in geology. Uniformitarianism says that forces that we see on Earth today account for the physical makeup of the Earth. So we don't need to talk about catastrophes, we can just talk about processes in common observation today. This uniformitarianism gave geology and gave our knowledge of the natural world extensive time so that with uniformitarianism, the Earth has been dated at 4.6 billion years. As James Hutton, one of the originators of uniformitarianism, said, geology finds no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. Geology also contributes the theory of continental drift. This theory says that continents float on plates. These plates 
drift over the surface of the earth, we now observe that we are drifting closer to Asia at about an inch a year. The Atlantic Ocean is growing. The Pacific Ocean is shrinking. Doing this process backwards, we find that the continents fit together and around 200 million years ago, all the continents formed one great supercontinent called Pangaea. So continental drift, another theory of geology, also gives us this extended period of time in Earth's development. Also contributed by geology is the fact that the early Earth's atmosphere was fundamentally different from that of present day Earth. We know this because some of the older rocks contain iron that is not oxidized. Iron that forms in the presence of oxygen is oxidized so this early atmosphere was a reducing atmosphere, not an oxygen-containing atmosphere. And oxygen was derived later when life first formed. The first forms of life produced oxygen as one of the products of their metabolism. So later rocks contain oxidized iron. Physics dates the origin of this universe at 14 billion years dramatically supporting, supported this past summer when the satellite, I think we all heard about the satellite out in space that picked up the ripples left from the Big Bang. So physics, another branch of science separate from biology, separate from geology, and a, and a science that's based on laws and mathematics, gives us another, another picture of a universe that is at least 14 billion years old. Biology, the science of my primary concern, underwent a synthesis in the 1930s and 1940s. So now we're, we're from geology and physics supporting the pro this, this period of time that we need for life to evolve. We come to biology. Biology, uh, underwent a synthesis, as I said, in the 30s and 40s. This synthesis brought together all the different areas of biology under the theory of evolution. In biology, we have only a very few theories. One of these is cell theory that says that all organisms are made of cells. This theory is supported by our observations as evolutionary theory is. The synthesis then basically allows us to make predictions based on evolutionary theory in each of the subsciences of biology. Genetics gives evidence for a monophyletic origin of life, okay, for a single organismal origin of life on Earth and a mechanism by which beneficial traits can be inherited. The genetic code contained in our DNA is universal. Our DNA codes for amino acids which build proteins and all DNA in bacteria to humans contains the same code. Genes exist in various forms giving us individuality, and we pass half our genes to each descendant. Genetics has given evolution rich detail, and the two subdivisions of biology are today inseparable. Developmental biology, another subdivision of biology, gives us further evidence of evolution. Developmental biology reveals the presence of vestigial organs. Vestigial organs are useless organs found on organisms. So when we were embryos, if we can remember back that far, we had pharyngeal gills and we had tails. There's no function for these structures, but we have them as a remnant of our ancestry that we keep in the protection of the womb where we're protected from harsh selection. Anatomy and morphology independently surmise that a single occipital condyle 
at the base of your skull is primitive, whereas two occipital condyle is advanced. Primitive, this primitive condition is found in or, older organisms in the fossil record, which is separate then from the science of anatomy and morphology. And so we have confirmation of this observation of primi a primitive character in the fossil record and in the science of anatomy and morphology. In my own area, animal behavior, we're constantly observing behaviors explainable in the context of evolution by natural selection and otherwise inexplicable. One example comes from egrets. When egrets are studied, they nest in colonies. During years of low food, the oldest chick pecks the next oldest chick, the next oldest chick pecks the chick beneath it. Each of these chicks exhibit this aggression when there is low resource availability. And during periods of low resource availability, each nest gives rise to one strong chick rather than spreading the resources between chicks. So this is predicted by evolutionary theory that each parent will maximize its output by allowing this aggression and allowing the strongest chick to prevail in each nest. Taxonomy, the naming of organisms, has changed from an early ununified science where each organism was named separately and no relationship was observed into the modern science of systematics, which incorporates evolutionary relationships into the name of each organism. So now when we name an organism, it must consider, we must consider the evolutionary relationship of that organism before it takes a name. So each of these subsciences gets information from evolution and gives information back to evolution the science of evolution. The study of ecology describes relationships between organisms and their environment. In ecology, we have found the, that competition for resources results in a division called resource partitioning. And this resource partitioning leads to a divergence in the types of organisms living in the same place at the same time. Biogeography, the distribution of organisms, made no sense until its father, Alfred Russell Wallace, co-discovered evolution by natural selection with Charles Darwin. Today, we expect and find unique island populations and commonalities between continents only recently separated. Thank you. Study any subdivision of biology or study paleontology and find more than examples and support for evolution. Everywhere you look, the evidence and predictive power are overwhelming. My colleagues for the last few weeks have been giving me examples, and I'm sorry that I haven't been able to share all these examples with you because of the, of the time limit. Um, creationists ask us to abandon reason discard evolution because its teaching offends their religious orthodoxy. Christian scientists are <coughs> offended by germ theory. Should we abandon our teaching of the immune system and our reaction to infectious agents? Historically, alchemists believed they could convert any element to any other element. Do they deserve equal time in our chemistry classes? I believe this is not a debate between creation and evolution, but between creation and modern science, because evolution is supported by all of the modern sciences. I ask you to accept evolution as a reasonable explanation of biological diversity. As Charles Darwin said, there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that while this planet has gone cycling on, according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Thank you.
Thank you. I remind you that we are here to take questions. I encourage you to write questions and bring them up to me or hand them to the ushers. I'm told there was a shortage of forms. It's fine with me if you use a piece of notebook paper or anything else you've got. Please just make it legible. I encourage questions because the whole purpose of this is to encourage the discussion. Okay? Dr. Hoban. Hello, hello. All right, is this one on? Can you hear me back there? No, I got the switch on here. Get it in closer, okay. Uh, <clears throat> Appreciate you coming tonight. I'm from Pensacola, Florida, where it's a little warmer than it is out here. Uh, about froze to death when I got off the airplane. Uh, I believe this subject of creation evolution is a far cry from a dead horse. Uh, some have wished it would die and get buried so they could go on and live their lifestyle the way they like without a god, I believe is one of the major motivating factors for the rapid acceptance of the theory of evolution in the 1800s in the midst of the Industrial Revolution. But it's certainly not a dead horse. There's a very rapidly growing movement of creation scientists uh, men with uh, extremely uh, great uh, academic uh, credentials who will say we strongly believe in creation. There are still many thousands of scientists who do believe this earth is young, less than 10,000 years old, and that it did not and could not have evolved even if it was billions of years old. It simply could not have happened. I would challenge you to read the quote book. I have uh, several copies here you can come take a look at. 130 quotes by evolutionists, leading brand name evolutionists who are saying, look, we have no proof. Sorry, you know. She quoted each of the different brands of science, the biology, earth science, physical science, uh, taxonomy, et cetera, as giving evidence for evolution. Um, and we'll get into more of that in the question and answer session, I'm sure. I believe this subject is extremely important because what you believe determines how you behave. It settles your world view, as we call it. And there are basically only two options. Either this world created itself or somebody else created it. If you believe in the philosophy of evolution, you, you will look at this world through the world view of evolution and your behavior and your attitudes on a multitude of subjects will be vastly different than a creationist. For instance, people divide on the question of creation and evolution down the same lines and into the same camps that they, that they divide on the question of abortion and euthanasia and pornography. Is, if there is a God that we have to be responsible to, then it throws a different light on your attitude and your behavior in a number of extremely important subjects. Um, I believe kids should see both sides. For 70 years in the Soviet Union, students were sheltered from any information or um, knowledge about capitalism. There was a deliberate censorship in all the libraries and all the universities to keep students from understanding and learning about how capitalism can work. Students were not taught in the Soviet Union how to develop their own business, how to be successful in business, how to make money. They were not taught that, that was, that was taboo. And now that they have a little freedom over there, they, they don't know what to do with it because they haven't been given the information. The students did not see both sides fairly in an academic situation. Students today are not being presented both sides fairly. The evidence against evolution, the evidence for creation, which I strongly believe in. I taught high school science 15 years and now travel and speak on this subject, generally in churches and schools. I do a lot of university and uh, college uh, seminars and debates and things on this topic because I think it's extremely important for the welfare of our society that students see both sides. Um, it is a religious question. Evolution is a religious belief. They defend it with religious zeal. There is no scientific empirical evidence to back it up. There are many who strongly believe in it. I strongly believe in creation, though I was raised to believe in evolution. I believe uh, this is a religious question and it's not gonna be settled. It's a belief uh, that some people choose to have. If you go ahead and flip my slides on, let me run through just a couple of things quickly. One of the main ingredients that evolution depends upon and must have is lots of time, billions of years. If it could be shown that the world is not billions of years old, the argument would be over in the first round. If there is any empirical evidence, I've got a number of things. I thought we had 30 minutes, so I'm gonna have to skip a few. My wife, Jo, just graduated from college finally. I have three kids, one of each. <laughs> uh, let me skip up to a few things. Adolf Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. The secret to getting a lie believed is constant repetition. Hitler knew that and certainly practiced it in his society. It's used in advertising. They do it with cigarettes and cowboys. Always putting the two together when there is absolutely no relation between smoking and cowboys. No relation at all. 
You don't have to smoke to be a cowboy, and all cowboys don't smoke, and if you smoke, you don't become a cowboy. There is no connection. But by constantly pounding away with that type of advertising, people subconsciously start to think, man, if you're going to be a cowboy, you've got to smoke Marlboro. That's, it's, it's an advertising technique, and it's very effective. The same is done with sports and alcohol. Bud Dumber, I mean uh, Budweiser, and uh, football, for instance. There's no connection between alcohol and sports. No connection at all. It's the opposite of what an athlete needs. You want your quarterback full of beer when he's out there calling the plays? There is no connection. But they have successfully sold the idea that somehow, if you go to a sporting event, you got to drink. If you're going to be an athlete, you got to drink. When actually, it's the, far, it's the opposite of what any, any athlete needs. They are polar opposites. That is exactly what has been done in the teaching of science. For the last 30 years especially, and I have, I have an extensive collection, probably nearly all of the public high school science textbooks from all the major publishers and many of the grade school textbooks. Here's the way it's done. This is a first grade textbook from Merrill Science. Let me focus a little bit. A first grade textbook, picture of a dinosaur, and it says, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. The students are taught when they're in first grade, the world is four and a half billion years old. They teach them again in second grade. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. Life, too, has evolved on Earth. First and second graders believe everything you tell them. You tell a kid that in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, you keep repeating the lie over and over and over, and he's going to believe it just because that's all he's heard all of his life. It doesn't make it true, but it becomes true by virtue of repetition. And science has a long history of constantly repeating for centuries something that is not true. I love science. I am not against science. And this is not religion versus science. This is religion versus religion because evolution is a religion, not a science, as we'll demonstrate in a minute. For years, they taught that heavy objects fall faster than lighter objects. That was taught dogmatically for 2,000 years. Galileo came up with a simple question. He said, fellows, does a 10-pound rock fall faster than a 5-pound rock? And they said, of course. Aristotle said it does, so it must. Galileo said, if I took a 10-pound rock and I broke it in half, and I tied the two pieces together with a string, and I dropped it, would it fall like a five-pound rock or a ten-pound rock? A brilliant question. And that one question totally stumped those who were teaching that there was a difference in velocity of objects falling to Earth. We know today that aside for wind friction, everything falls the same speed. But for 2,000 years, that false doctrine was taught by the majority. For many years, it was taught the Earth was in the center of the solar system. As the evidence accumulated from the planet's movements, they began to notice that several of the planets go backwards for a few weeks as Earth passes them up. Mars and Venus and others have back backwards loop. So they de de developed elaborate theories to try to, to try to rescue the geocentric theory. They came up with theories of epicycles. They said, well, the planets are not only going around the Earth, they're going in little circles while they go in their major circle, epicycles. The mathematics became horrendous to try to justify that. What they should have done is abandon their basic fundamental theory. The Earth is not in the middle. And today we have many elaborate theories trying to satisfy and justify and resurrect and uh, uh, save the theory of evolution. We have the punctuated equilibrium, the hopeful monster theory of Gould and Goldschmidt and Niles Eldridge and those fellows. And there are 14 different varieties of evolution out there, all of them disproving the others. And they, what they ought to do is abandon the basic concept. This world could not evolve, did not evolve. George Washington was bled to death by his own doctors in 1799 because they taught the doctrine of humors. They said if a person is sick, he has bad blood. Now, the men that taught this, that bled, that bled George Washington to death, were sincere, they were highly educated, extremely intelligent, and wrong. And we have professors today that sincerely, honestly believe, I don't question the intelligence, I don't question the educational level, I don't question the, the motive in most cases, but it doesn't make them right. The majority is not always right, and in a multitude of instances has been wrong. I'll give you a few examples. The first law of thermodynamics says that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Well, there is obviously a physical world here. So how did it get here? If matter cannot be created, how did it get here? It's just a fundamental question. Where did matter come from? The evolutionists have come up with the Big Bang. The telescope last summer supposedly saw the results of the Big Bang. What they said they detected, and some overzealous reporter got a hold of that and blew it out of proportion, they said they saw 30 millionths of a degree difference in background radiation. The guy who invented the sensing mechanism on the telescope said, I don't know where they got that. He said, that thing won't sense 30 millionths of a degree. It's not that sensitive. And if there was 30 millionths of a degree difference, that still does not prove it came from a Big Bang. 
It could prove it was created perfect and is de de decaying, declining. It's not proof for either side. And no, there is no evidence for the Big Bang. There's a multitude of evidence against it, but it is taught dogmatically in the textbooks. Here's an example. Prentice Hall, General Science, 1992. 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. I was on the airplane flying to California uh, years ago, and I happened to sit next to a professor from Berkeley University. I don't know if you know anything about Berkeley, but Berkeley is not a Bible college. And <clears throat> as we were flying out there, the pr professor and I uh, got in discussion on creation evolution. We had a four-hour flight together from Dallas to Berkeley and to San Francisco. And he said he believed in the Big Bang Theory. And he told me that he said all the, all the dust in outer space 20 billion years ago started drawing together into this little tiny dot. And he said it was spinning faster and faster, which is just what they say in the books. It spun faster and faster. And finally, it exploded out into space. Boom, the Big Bang. I said, sir, could I ask you a couple of questions? He said, sure, go ahead. I said, where did matter come from? Who made matter? He said, well, science has not been able to answer that question. I said, OK. Second question. Where did, uh, you said all this matter, all this dust in space started drawing together. What made it get together? He said, well, gravity, all particles have an attraction for each other. And I said, sir, I understand that. I teach physical science. Physics is one of my courses. I understand gravitational attraction, acceleration due to gravity, the inverse square law. I teach all that stuff. But that doesn't explain where gravity comes from. Who made gravity? Who made the laws that obviously govern this universe? The laws of gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, etc. There are, there are laws that govern the worlds. Who made them? He said, well, I don't know. I said, okay. You said it was all squeezing into this little bitty dot, spinning real fast, and it exploded into space. I said, where did the energy come from? It requires energy to make something move. You have to put energy in. Where did the energy come from? He said, well, I, I don't know. I said, okay, sir, can I ask you another question? He said, sure, go ahead. He was 0 for 3 so far. I said, uh, I said does Berkeley University, where you teach, have a merry-go-round? You know what a merry-go-round is, don't you? You go round, round, round until you puke. You've been on those before. He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round. I said, well, that's unfortunate, because uh, you can put six kids on the merry-go-round. If you get six fourth graders, put them on the merry-go-round, and get the football team out there to get, push it as fast as it'll go. We're going to get the merry-go-round going clockwise as fast as it'll go. Now, if you have a digital watch, you may not know what clockwise means. So you see me afterwards, I'll explain that. But we're going to spin the thing clockwise. The kids are going to go through four very distinct phases on that merry-go-round. They're going to start off in phase one. They'll be screaming and yelling, oh, boy, this is fun. Let's go faster, faster. You get up around 30 or 40 miles an hour, the kids are going to enter phase two. That's where they stop screaming, and they just quietly concentrate on trying to hang on for dear life. <laughs> you get up around 60 or 70 miles an hour, they enter phase three. That's where they're screaming again. But now they're going to be screaming, stop, stop, slow down, let me off. Don't stop, keep going. You get up around 100 miles an hour, or maybe sometimes less. You enter phase four. That's where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. <laughs> now, when the kids fly off the merry-go-round, you will notice a neat phenomenon. If the merry-go-round is going clockwise, as the kids fly off, they will be spinning clockwise until they encounter some resistance like a tree or a pole or the parking lot. <laughs> They'll be going the same direction as the merry-go-round was. That's one of the laws of physics called the conservation of angular momentum. In a frictionless environment, if a spinning object fragments, the pieces that spin off spin the same direction because the outer part is already moving faster than the inner part, and so it maintains that same rotational velocity, same rotational direction. The conservation of angular momentum is a well-known law, and the professor on, in, on the airplane said, oh, yes, Mr. Hoven, I'm familiar with that. I said, would you explain something to me then? He said, sure, go ahead. I said, if the universe started from a Big Bang 4.6 billion years ago, would you explain to me why all nine planets in our solar system go around the sun counterclockwise while the sun spins clockwise? The sun spins backwards once every 25 days. This is a microcosm of the macrocosm. How could we end up with nine planets going one direction and a sun spinning the opposite direction? It could not have come from a Big Bang. How did it happen? He said, well, I, I guess I don't have an answer for that. I said, OK, no problem. I said, uh, these planets are not only going around the sun, these planets are spinning around themselves. However, seven of the planets are spinning one direction, counterclockwise like the Earth, viewed from their North Pole. Two of them, Venus and Uranus, are spinning backwards, possibly Pluto. I said, how did the planets, two planets get going backwards? He said, well, I, I guess I don't know. I said, OK, no problem. I said, uh, there are 50 or 60 known moons in our solar system. Out of those 50 or 60 known moons, at least 11 spin backwards. Four of them travel backwards around their planet. How did this happen? He said, well, I don't know. I said, would you agree that that's pretty hard on the Big Bang Theory, that uh, if this little microcosm is part of the macrocosm, uh, that goes against the known laws of science? He said, well, you, you have a point there. He said, how do you think it happened? I said, well, I think it's pretty simple. 
I think in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And God did it that way on purpose, just to make the Big Bang Theory look. 30 million years ago, these animals evolved. They are ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestral to humans? They don't, they don't seem to be able to figure it out. For 30 years now, we've been teaching the kids they are nothing but an animal. And if you look in the public schools today, many of them act like animals. And they don't seem to get the connection. It's a direct result of what we are teaching them. If I told you that if you kissed a frog, it would turn into a prince, you would say, no, Mr. Hovind, that's a fairy tale. But in the universities and, and high schools in, in this country, they teach frogs do turn to princes. If you add one magic ingredient, and it's not a kiss, the magic ingredient that changes a frog to a prince is time, billions of years. Between three billion and three and a half billion years ago, it is in all the textbooks. You see it everywhere. You see it on Carl Pagan's show. I mean, uh, Sagan, Cosmos, uh, billions of years ago. And in National Pornographic, I mean, uh, Geographic, they talk about over billions of years. It's just, that is a fundamental belief in evolution. They have to have billions of years. I have nearly 500 scientific evidences that the world is not billions of years old. And those that want to teach real science need to give an answer to every one of them. If they, you'd have to overcome every obstacle in order to say the world is billions of years old. If I said this building is 8,000 years old, that could be easily disproven by a number of factors. Electricity wasn't around 8,000 years ago, as far as we know. So you could prove I was wrong in that statement. Uh, Dr. Richardson says the world is 4.6 billion years old. The human population speaks very loudly against that. The population chart here indicates the whole thing started less than 5,000 years ago. Well, the Bible teaches there was a flood that destroyed the whole population of the world and began 5,000 years ago. How much time left? 20 minutes? Good, don't keep track. Okay. The sun is burning and shrinking five feet per hour. The sun is burning six million tons of hydrogen per second converted to helium thrown off into the atmosphere. The sun is shrinking. All astronomers realize that. The shrinking sun at that rate, and we don't know if it's linear or geometric, I understand that, but 20 million years ago, the sun would have been big enough to touch the earth. If they want to teach the world is 4.6 billion years old, they better have an answer for the fact the sun is shrinking. It is shrinking. The magnetic field of the earth is getting weaker and weaker. NASA says the half-life is 830 years. 15,000 years ago, nothing could live on Earth because the magnetic field would have been too strong. Magnetic field, by the way, prevents the formation of carbon-14. Carbon-14 in the atmosphere is increasing because of the declining magnetic field. So if you dig up an animal from 5,000 years ago, he's going to carbon date like he's 50,000 years old because they had less carbon-14 in the atmosphere. They forgot to allow for the declining magnetic field. They went to the moon, got lunar rocks, dated them eight different ways, got eight different numbers. None of the numbers fit their theory, so they were all rejected, and they picked the number that fit the theory. The moon is going around the Earth, but the moon is getting further and further away. The moon is receding. Astronomers will tell you we are losing the moon. At the current recession rate, going backwards in time, the moon used to be closer. You bring the moon back in a couple million years ago, the tides would have been so great that it would have drowned everything on Earth twice a day. It can't be millions of years old. I've got tons of stuff. The dust on the moon was a great surprise to the astronauts. They went up there and discovered the dust was only three-fourths of an inch deep. They predicted a, an inch of dust every 10,000 years based on the dust in space and the moon going around running into it like your windshield collects bugs, you know. And they put giant landing pads to, collect the, to settle in on top of the dust. Neil Armstrong stepped off on it and he said, hey, this is only three-fourths of an inch thick. 6,000 years, 7,000 years worth of dust up there. It can't be millions of years old. The salt's in the ocean. Does that mean quit? Okay. I've just begun. I've got nearly 500. If you want to stay for the next six days, we can go. There's many obstacles to the idea that the Earth is billions of years old. It cannot be billions of years old. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Again, I remind you, if you have questions, please. We have ushers in the back who I understand it will bring the questions up to you if you just raise your hand or stick them out in the aisle or something else. We have a number, and if you don't mind, I'll begin right with them. We're going to start with a, a rather simple one, and I guess I'll ask Dr. Hoven to address this first and then Dr. Richardson to respond. Is creation still going on? Is it possible that evolution is the means of creation? I would say uh, absolutely not. My idea, the God that I worship, does not use blind random chance. He knows what he wants first time, and he makes it right first time. There's no need for progressive creation. The Bible certainly teaches he was finished and done on the sixth day, and he rested the seventh day. There has been no more creation, only preservation and decay as it is falling apart from the curses on the earth, and we are definitely falling apart. Our rotational velocity is declining. We're losing our speed, indicating it can't be millions of years old. I got another one in there. Um, <clears throat> 
So, no, I don't believe creation is still going on. It, is a, it was a finished one-time act. The evolutionists will quickly say uh, that evolution of many species is no longer going on either. Ask them why, since chimpanzees are still having babies, none of the chimpanzees are becoming more human. They will say, well, they reached a state of perfection. So evolution has, for all practical purposes, stopped or slowed down to the point where it's not visible to observe. So really, both are taking the same evidence that there is nothing changing dramatically now. Both are interpreting it in light of their preconceived idea. Okay. okay. Thank you. Dr. Richardson, is it possible that evolution is the means of creation? No, these things came off. <laughs> um, is it possible that evolution is the means of creation? Um, I'm afraid that I don't believe in creation, so I don't think that evolution is a, a tool for it. I believe that evolution is still continuing. We have many evidences of this today. We have many responses of organisms to natural selection. We, we have um, many, numerous examples of natural selection leading to divergence of populations, leading to changes in populations. So evolution continues. Um, whether it's a tool of creation or not, I, I'm not here to answer religious questions. Okay, thank you. I'll direct the next question to you first then, Dr. Richardson. Since both creationism and Darwinism are not sciences in the true sense of the word, but actually religious, how can either be taught and displayed in the, quote, naked public sphere? The, the naked public sphere. Naked, I'm sorry, naked public square. I didn't write these, I'm sorry. I don't believe Darwinism is a, is a religion. Uh, it, it is not based on faith. Uh, my faith is separate from my science. My family is a very religious family. Uh, they do not believe in the literal translation of the, of the Bible, however. All of my family is, uh, keeps their religion answering questions of religious significance and keeps their science, their reasoning mind, working and answering questions with, with respect to reason. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, get, get, I'll bet it would. Very good. I, I think we could probably get a squeal if we're all turned on at the same time, so don't get too surprised if all of a sudden our eardrums are destroyed. If creation happened quickly, why do we see an evolutionary order in the fossil record? You may begin. Okay. If creation happened quickly, why do we see an evolutionary, what was the question? Progression? An evolutionary order in the order. fossil record. Okay. We do not see an evolutionary order at all in the fossil record. Nearly all types of fossils have been found in every single layer. There have been human skulls, human skeletons found in so-called Cambrian rock. The truth of the matter is the entire geologic column, the 12 different layers of geologic column, is a hoax. It does not exist any place in the world except in the textbook. I taught Earth science 13 years. Geologic column does not exist. If there is an order to the fossils, and there is a slight order, birds are generally found on the top, that would be positive proof of a flood because, number one, in a, flo in a flood situation, a bird's the last one to drown. And when he does drown, he's got hollow bones and feathers, so he floats. Of course, he's buried on top. But there is no true, definite order to the geologic column, and it certainly does not support evolution. Modern horse skeletons have been found in layers lower than Eohippus. Okay, thank you. Dr. Richardson. The Would you like me to repeat the question? Please. If creation happened quickly, why do we see an evolutionary order in the fossil record? Thank you. Um, there is an evolutionary order in the fossil record. The geologic time scale <coughs> was written by early geologists who were all creationists. Creationists constructed the geologic time scale and used it to, to support their theory of successive creations. Early creation theory said that there were four separate creations. Spontaneous generation or creation following each of four successive floods. So the geologic time scale is well studied, well delineated. There is a progression from bacteria to modern organisms. And 
i know that birds float to some extent but they're also a modern organism and we would expect to find modern organisms fossilized most recently on top of the geologic time scale and that's just what we find okay a related question perhaps are there any intermediate life forms or fossils in the geologic record that prove evolution occurred as opposed to mere natural selection within a species or kind? Did you get that one? I'm not sure I did. Let me read it again. Are there any intermediate life forms, fossils, in the geologic record that prove evolution actually occurred as opposed to mere natural selection within a species or kind? Oh, definitely. There are, there are intermediate types that but I, I flinch at this proof again because of my early introduction. Remember, proofs are based on mathematics. So what we have for evolution is massive amounts of evidence. We do not have proof. Pr it, proofs are confined to the hard sciences of physics and chemistry. We have uh, evidence. We have Archaeopteryx, which is a, a form intermediate between the, the ancestral bird and our modern birds. We have uh, intermediates, we have therapsids that are, pre are ancestral to the mammals. We have many intermediate forms between ancestral forms and modern forms. Sorry, I can't okay. figure these things out either. All right. Uh, intermediate fossils. I would say, without question, there have never been any discovered that are verifiable. Only five Archaeopteryx fossils have been found, only three with a head, only one was sectioned. Um, Archaeopteryx is 100% bird, nothing more than an extinct type of bird. It had claws on its wings, so does the ostrich today, so does the Hoetzin in South America. It had long tail vertebrae, so does a swan, tail vertebrae identical to a swan's vertebrae. Archaeopteryx had a shallow breastbone, so does the Hoetzin in South America because of its large crop, it's a leaf eater. Archaeopteryx was nothing but a bird. If it was intermediate, it would certainly take an awful lot more than one intermediate step to go from a reptile to a bird. Reptiles have solid bones, birds have hollow bones. Reptiles have a three-chambered heart, birds have a four-chambered heart. They have a totally different reproductive system. Reptiles are covered by scales, birds are covered by feathers. Feathers are very different than a scale, if you've ever seen the two. There are multitudes of differences, and it ta would take certainly more than one step. And the only one, the one they always point to is Archaeopteryx, and I can show you quotes by many of the most famous evolutionists who will say, no, Archaeopteryx is not a missing link. It's just an extinct species of bird. It had teeth in its beak, so did the Hesperornis and a few other extinct birds. No known birds today have teeth in their beak. But going from teeth to no teeth is not an improvement, it's a loss. That's not an example of an improving of the species. Just like going from a monkey with a tail to a man without a tail would certainly not be an improvement. A tail would be very handy to hold your coke while you're driving your car. Okay, Dr. Hovind, you get to start the next one. I think. <laughs> Is that where we're at? Okay. Did the atmosphere originally have oxygen in it? If it did, would that not bind with the precursors of life, making original spontaneous generation of life? If it did not have oxygen in it, I assume, would not the UV radiation snuff all life originally formed? Uh, complicated question. The, uh, the original atmosphere apparently has always had oxygen. The only reason they came up with the reducing atmosphere with the experiments from uh, uh, Uri and Miller and those fellas was to, tr they knew that if there were oxygen, it would destroy the life uh, that it created. It would oxidize and couldn't survive in the presence of oxygen. Uh, Dr. Richardson said that the oxygen are in our atmosphere is a result of life producing this oxygen. <laughs> There's an awful lot of oxygen on the Earth. I believe it's the second most abundant element on the Earth. Uh, we have a little problem there with the development of these complex elements from simpler ones. We've never seen that happening. We see a number of elements that decay and get simpler. Nothing increases in complexity. That's never been observed. You can't change it to anything more complex. So I would say the Earth has always had an uh, oxygen in the atmosphere. Those that have studied the deeper strata rocks are finding oxygen there. There is oxidized iron found in nearly all layers of the so-called geologic column. But again, it goes back, if you, if you assume the geologic column is true and you assume evolution has occurred and everything has to be interpreted in light of that, that evidence, the geologic column becomes the Bible to the evolutionist. Everything must fit the geologic column or the evidence is rejected. Uh, so that's the, the, the whole problem was Lyell and Hutton and Cuvier and, and uh, Steno and some of those fellows who developed the geologic column. Many were creationists. Dr. Richardson's exactly right. I, I'm certainly not one of those who believes there were four catastrophes and four different creations. The creationists in the 1800s were simply wrong. They taught the fixity of the species. 
they taught there is no variation at all. They said if there are 240 different kinds of dogs, then God must have made 240 kinds of dogs. That was a mistake. That is not true. There is a wide, a tremendous amount of variation available in the genetic code. So the evolutionists overreacted to the creationists who were wrong. The evolutionists said, well, hey, all the finches that Darwin saw probably had a common ancestor. The creationists said, no, if there's 40 kinds of finches, then God made 40 kinds of finches. And the creationists of the 1800s were wrong. All, the, all Darwin's finches did have a common ancestor, and the ancestor was a finch. Yes, there is variation. Yes, there is speciation, but it stays within the same kind of animal. But the finch does not have the same ancestor as the tomato and the whale and the hamster. Have you already had this one, or is it your turn? I will need that question repeated. Pardon? I will need the question repeated. Oh, dear. <laughs> I think it was about Thanks oxygen. a lot. Wasn't it about oxygen? Did the atmosphere originally have oxygen in it? If it did, would that not bind with precursors of life, making original spontaneous generation of light? If it did not, would not the UV radiation, that means ultraviolet, snuff all life originally form? Uh, no. The, the initial atmosphere of the Earth did not have oxygen present. Uh, I cited the, the uh, iron formation as one point of evidence on this behalf. Uh, and I wanted to reply to a couple uh, points that Dr. Hovine brought up. First of all, there's a common misconception between the second theory, uh, the second law of thermodynamics disagreeing with evolution. The second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, the amount of disorder is constantly increasing. Disorder is not the same thing as complexity. So when we talk about complexity through evolutionary time, it has nothing to do with order versus disorder. A paramecium is every bit as ordered energetically, which is what the second law of thermodynamics talks about, as we are. So evolution does not fly in the face of the second law of thermodynamics that is based on a misconception of the second law of thermodynamics. The second law is referring to the amount of usable energy, the amount of usable energy in the, in the closed system that we call the universe is constantly decreasing. That has no bearing particularly on evolution. Okay, next question, if you'll stay there. You continually use fossils as proof of evolution. Can you explain why we have tons of fossils of the organisms from which we evolved and also tons of fossils to which what they evolved to? Let me try that again. <laughs> Can you explain why we have tons of fossils of the organisms from which we evolved and also tons of fossils of the organisms to which we evolved, I believe, but no fossils at all of intermediate organisms that must have existed over the long time span it takes to evolve. Example, ape dash 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 to man, many fossils, man exists but no intermediate. Why? Intermediates do exist between our ancestors, which were not apes. We, have, we share an ancestor with apes, but apes are not our, our ancestor. And we have, we have fossil evidence for many uh, intermediates between that ancestor and us. We don't have intermediates between apes and ourselves because there would be none because they are not our ancestors. Uh, I would have to say, of course, that's wishful thinking. There are no intermediate species at all. They've, they did not exist. It's not like we're looking for missing links. The entire chain is missing. Uh, it did not happen. Similarities in structures between us and the apes or an ape-like so-called ancestor, similarities in body structure are certainly no proof of evolution. That's proof of an intelligent creator who used the same design over and over. The Honda Civic and the Honda Accord and the Honda Prelude have similarities, not because they all evolved from a Chevy, but because they all came from the mind of the same designer. So similarity is just as much proof of a common designer as it would be of a common ancestor. It is really not part of the argument. 
Uh, Dr. Uh, my colleague has mentioned uh, natural selection several times. Natural selection certainly is also no help for evolution. Natural selection is just as much proof for creation as it is for evolution. Natural selection doesn't tell you how the animal got there. It just tells you which one survives. That would be proof just as much that an intelligent creator gave his creation the ability to produce a variety of offspring so that some would survive in any given environment. So natural selection is really not part of the argument at all. Uh, it's just as much evidence for creation as it is for evolution. It really has, has no bearing on the subject. OK, I'm going to throw you a, a general question that I have about five or six uh, versions of. In effect, I'll, I'll read you one, but, but I'll, I'll give you the general question. We believe what we can prove if we could or had the ability to prove that God exists, every person on the earth would have faith in the same God. And what I have five or six copies of is how do you prove that there is a God? Oh, I certainly couldn't prove that. I could demonstrate it. I could give some evidences. Uh, but uh, changed lives would be one. He certainly has changed my life 24 years ago when I accepted Christ as my Savior. It's been a mountainous change since then. Um, but I would say asking for uh, proof of something like that, uh, I could, of course, turn the question around and say, give me some proof. Uh, show me what gravity is. Uh, nobody knows what it is. We know what it does, but we don't know what it is. You can't give me a jar of gravity, and you certainly can't paint it red. What is gravity? What is light? What is magnetism? There are many fundamental forces that we use all the time, but have never seen and have no idea what they are. Uh, I have never seen God. I did not see a 600-foot Jesus, and I don't think Oral did either. Um, uh, but if he did, he'd still be running. Uh, so I'm certainly not one of those kind, but uh, I think... Uh, I, it, is, it is something I take by faith. I, if I, I've never been to Japan, never been there, but I have a Casio watch. May, I'm sure it's made in Japan, and uh, I would guarantee there's a Japanese watchmaker over there, even though I've never seen it. I, by faith, would accept that. That's no problem. I see the results. I see the creation, me and you and the world, and I, uh, there has to be a creator. There is design that indicates a designer. That argument has never been successfully answered by the evolutionists. Uh, design demands a designer. They spend millions of dollars putting telescopes up to look for intelligent signals from outer space because they know that would prove there's intelligent life out there. And yet there are signals bombarding us all the time. It's, it's just obvious what was created and what was not. I could get a bag of objects and put rocks and coins and watches and sticks in there and have you reach in and pull one out and tell me. I could, a five-year-old could tell you whether it was man-made or a naturally occurring object. And looking at the human body, looking at anatomy, looking at the structure of one paramecium, which is more complex than the entire space shuttle, you would have to say this was designed. The genetic code, the DNA code, had to be designed. Dropping letters out of a box does not form Webster's Dictionary. I don't care how many billions of years you do it, the letters would wear out before you'd form the dictionary. and. Uh, the genetic code is far too complex to ever have arisen by chance. So as far as I got off the question, proving the existence of God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, attempt to. I would say that's a, something you're going to have to take on faith, just like the evolutionist takes on faith that there is a mysterious motivating force driving toward more complexity by pouring energy in. Adding energy to a closed system doesn't improve order. You can run a tornado through a junkyard and you'll never assemble a Boeing 747. Increased or energy input Hurricane Andrew did not assemble any buildings down in southern Florida, uh, it's, even though it tore up several lumber yards. It okay, thank you. I think we need to, to go on if we may. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off, but I'm kind of looking at a five-minute clock here. Do you wish to handle how do we prove the existence of God or perhaps uh, I would something close? I would uh, refer to my opening remarks. And I keep my religion as one part of my life and my science as another part. My science, I subject to evidence and, and material observations. My faith is just that. It is part of, a, of the non-material world, and it is answerable with questions directed by faith. Thank you. Dr. Richardson first here. I'm going to throw you 
paraphrasing what I've gotten five or six copies of here. If is there anything that evolutionists know for sure, not just quotation marks theory, and a number of the others have to do with how does a scientist define theory versus how does a creationist define theory? Well, theory is defined as a, a fact in science, a fact based on empirical evidence. And a creationist, I believe, adds re, uh, religious faith to that equation, and I would find that inappro an inappropriate uh, use of that. Now, is there anything that evolutionists know for sure? Is that the question? Correct. Again, I, I get my uh, hackles up whenever I hear prove uh, with respect to biology. We weren't listening in the beginning when I talked about proofs being confined to the sciences of physics and chemistry. So please, you know, listen a little bit so I don't, don't have to do this. So can, uh, does evolution have evidence for, is there evidence of evolution? We have the fossil record. We have the current study of animal behavior where if we ask questions in an evolutionary framework, we have predictive power in answering those questions. We have the science of ecology. We have subsciences, all of the subsciences of biology provide evidence for evolution and use evolution to, um, to give it predictive power. So yes, we have, we have more than you can imagine, volumes and volumes. If I brought my library and lined it up here next to Dr. Holbein's library, just the books that I read uh, teaching an evolution course this, this term, um, we would fill, we fill the Winona library, is stacks and stacks of books on evolution. These are not speculation, they are empirical evidence upon empirical evidence, the entire fossil record, the entire subsciences of ecology, animal behavior, taxonomy, all of the subsciences, physiology, anatomy. Biology is full of empirical evidence for evolution. Dr. Hoban? Um, stating, listing all the sciences available certainly didn't offer any empirical evidence. You, to say that it exists, and I'd like to see it, uh, I, I'll be reasonable and rational. I've heard many evolutionists say, well, we have lots of evidence, but nobody's ever brought it forth. Many scientists who believe strongly in evolution will say, we have no empirical evidence, but we believe it strongly because the only other alternative is creation, and that clearly is unthinkable. Those, uh, all the sciences that Dr. Richardson named were started by creationists who were looking for design and order in this universe. Uh, many, nearly all of the early scientists in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s were creation scientists. Now, some were wrong in some of their theories. I understand that, okay? And, and we need to always uh, allow for that possibility that we may be wrong and be willing to uh, change and uh, uh, alter what we believe in light of the facts. As I mentioned earlier, if it could be proven the universe was not billions of years old, as I believe it clearly can be proven, then evolution would have to modify their theory to fit within the time work of eight to 10,000 years maximum, which of course could not happen. Uh, so uh, I would say there is, am I answering the question right? What, read it to me one more time. If you would please. If I have the right question. Is there anything that evolutionists know for sure, not just theory? Uh, uh, no, there is not. Uh, Dr. Uh, the cura Dr. Ropp, I believe, is the curator at the museum in uh, British Museum of Natural History, the largest fossil collection in the world, asked that question to the uh, S Chicago uh, Symposium of famous evolutionists from all over the place. He said, do any of you know anything for sure about evolution? Long period of silence. Finally, one man stood up and he said, I know one thing for sure. We shouldn't teach it in high school. That was his result. No, there has never been any empirical evidence offered for evolution. They always claim they have it. I would love to see it. And if you read a whole library full of books this quarter, that's, whew, I read a lot, but I, I can't go that far. Uh, I, I try to read a lot, and I'm willing to read anything by anybody. 
I'm willing to look at all the evidence from both sides, and I have never seen any empirical testable evidence. That's why, on the back of my business card, I offer $10,000 for anybody with any empirical evidence, a legitimate standing offer of four years now. If you've got some evidence, uh, please show it to me. Well, let's put it to the test. Let's show me life evolving from non-life. Let's do it in the laboratory. Miller certainly didn't. He made a few of simple amino acids. That's building the building blocks. He didn't make a cell. Certainly nothing that reproduces itself. We've never seen an animal change to any other kind of animal. It has never been observed in the fossil record, and it's not happening today. Chimpanzees today are still having babies, and they're still chimpanzees. Nothing changes. Okay. I'm going to throw at you, Dr. Hovind, a, again, a, a series that I think are, are all related. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if I can summarize, so let me just quickly read these. They're all kind of the same question in my mind. If there is a creator and he or she created, why would the creator make something like an appendix, a human organ which is useless and even dangerous? Why, it, why is there certain useless anatomical, why are there use certain useless anatomical parts of the body, such as the coccyx, the remnants of a tail, and useless muscles that are gradually disappearing? Isn't it true that 80 to 90 percent of our enzymes are also found in other animals? For example, pig insulin works in diabetic people. And isn't this evidence that we are biologically related? Uh, if human beings aren't related to apes, why do we have the muscles which gorillas and chimpanzees use to oppose their great toe and small toe? Some, there's an anatomist here. They're called the opponents, halicis, and the opponents, digiti minimi. Sorry, it's not minimus, it's minimi. I happen to be an anatomist. <laughs> Even though we can't make these motions, why is the bone and joint structure of our great toe like that of our thumb instead of like that of our other toes? if we didn't evolve from animals which could oppose their great toes, like chimpanzees and gorillas can. I think that's it. That's it? Did I do too many of, on you? No. I, I think the question is, why do we have evidence of, of things that would be, be evolutionarily remainders of things we don't use anymore? Okay, I think uh, the vestigial organ argument, of course, certainly does not prove evolution at all. Uh, that is, again, examples of losing something, not gaining something, which would be the opposite of evolution if they did exist. When the human anatomy was first being discussed and dis discovered in, uh, back several hundred years ago, they had a list of 180 vestigial organs. The tailbone was one, uh, the coccyx, the different muscles in the body, um, the appendix. I don't know of very many reputable uh, doctors that would say there are any vestigial organs. To my knowledge, there are n there's no such thing as a vestigial organ still on the list. It simply was a lack of our understanding. For years, they taught the pituitary gland was a vestigial organ, something we did not need, which certainly you do. Uh, the coccyx, the tailbone, is definitely not a vestigial organ. There are some definite uses for it. It holds a number of different muscles that are useful for different functions. Break yours sometime and try to sit down and you'll see. Uh, and again, losing a tail would be an example of a loss of information, not a gain. A tail would be a handy thing to have. So vestigial organs do not exist in the first place. And I was, I was very disappointed that Dr. Richardson referred to uh, vestigial organs in the embryonic stage. The ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny theory was disproven 50 years ago. The human baby never has gill slits. They are different folds of skin that develop into different parts of the respiratory and hearing tract. The baby never can breathe through them. Some of you have several chins. Some of you fat folks, you cannot breathe through any of them except the top one. Uh, the, the, the fact that the baby embryo looks like it has a tail, it simply isn't fully developed yet. Uh, the argument from ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny is, is the justification for abortion. After all, it's just a fish or just an amphibian. The baby does not go through the stages of evolution during development. It is 100% human the instant it is conceived. And to terminate the life uh, for, by an outsider from that okay, moment Okay, excuse on me. We are off topic. Okay, go ahead. Dr. Richardson. Uh, embryonically, we do have gill slits. They are vestigial. By definition, vestigial is useless. So, of course, we don't breathe through them. They are remnants of our ancestry. The ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny has been disproven. We do not pass through our ancestral stages, but that does not, that has nothing to do with our are uh, continuing to show some of these vestigial organs because they w we are not subject to natural selection as strongly in the womb as we are once we come out of the womb. So once w when we're in the womb, we are protected 
and there is not selection to get rid of some of these useless structures that we don't use. Vestigial, by definition, is non-usable, so of course you don't breathe through them in the womb. But they, uh, pharyngeal gill slits do give rise to structures of the ear, structures of the jaw. Uh, embryologically, they correspond very well to um, the pharyngeal gill slits of our ancestors. So we have many vestigial organs. Vestigial, by definition, is useless. So. Okay, I didn't just happen to pick this one out. It, it addresses the same thing, and, and maybe you can just say I already answered this, but it provides some information toward that. You mentioned that the pharyngeal gill slits are vestigial, but modern embryology has proved this wrong. As Dr. Ashley Montague, an anthropologist, stated, quote, the theory of recapitulation was destroyed in 1921 by Professor Walter Gerstang in a famous paper, since when no respectable biologist has ever used the theory of recapitulation because it was utterly unsound created by a Nazi-like preacher named Heckel. To whom do you go for your source of research on embryology? I see two questions in here. Now, is it true that no respectable biologist has ever used the theory of recapitulation? And to whom do you go for your source of research on embryology? Okay, I go to my embryology classes and I go to um, my readings of embryology when I talk about embryological origins. And I, was, I, I see that I've confused people by using the pharyngeal gill slits as my example. I did not mean to imply that I adhere to this old ancient theory of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould wrote a book about this, this subject in which he very thoroughly uh, took care of any vestigial doubts about ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny. So my source for, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, Ed. <laughs> Is it true that no respected, I'm sorry, that no respectable biologist has ever used the theory of recapitulation? Well, it was, it was respectable for a time until it was disproven. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't slander historical <laughs> biologists for using a theory that they didn't know any better about. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hovland. Um, yes, Dr. Richardson in her opening comments was giving the sciences that support evolution and she said developmental biology supports evolution because of vestigial organs including gill slits and tails while the baby is in the mother's womb. So she is using ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. We've got it on tape. Uh, it is still in the textbooks, that's for certain. I have quite all, nearly all the textbooks, and it is in there. They are still teaching in many of the textbooks. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. They will list evidences for evolution, and they will talk about embryonic development proving evolution. Similarities in a microscopic stage, of course, when the animal is smaller, it's tougher to see the differences, but it still doesn't prove they have a common ancestor. Similarities could easily prove a common creator. Bo the, the idea that there are similarities in development and similarities in the adult stages, two bones in the wrist, does not prove a common ancestor. It proves a common creator. Both can argue that as their point, and it, it's a mute point. It, it's not part of the argument. Similarities have nothing to do with evolution or creation. Uh, both, both are going to take that for evidence for their side. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if we've completely covered this or not, but, uh, but I'm going to, to come back to it. If you believe in creation, why go to the doctor? Either you believe or you don't. The laws of physics are always constant. Does this relate to, does faith in creationism relate to practice of medicine? I would guess that question is for me. Uh, <laughs> I definitely. Okay, sure. I definitely believe in creation, and I certainly go to the doctor. I think uh, the human body is extremely complex, and uh, any complex mechanism can go bad. I, I, I worked at General Motors. I helped build trucks. I, I believe that General Motors builds trucks, but I'm certainly not against mechanics. They do break down. Uh, the belief in creation uh, does not mean you can't. I don't understand any relation at all between belief in creation and not going to the doctor. I cannot see the logic in that. I'm sorry. Uh, Yes, I believe you ought to go to the doctor if you get sick. I have no problem with that. I, I go to the doctor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. You're next, or you're first up next then. Dr. Richardson, how does evolution explain development of the sexes and variety of species from one cell? Development of the sexes. So they want to know about the origin of genders uh, in reproduction. How does evolution explain development of the sexes and variety of species from one cell? Okay. <laughs> the Let's see, the theory of evolution takes us from simple cells to multiple cells, uh, all of which undergo asexual reproduction. And when we get to the multicelled organisms, we see the origins of, I'm sorry, some of the single celled organisms that are further derived do. Uh, exchange gametic information, which we would consider the role of sexual reproduction. So evolution uh, deals with the evolution of sex by saying that sexual reproduction increases the chances of variation in your genotype. Okay, every time you reproduce, you produce gametes that are half of your genome, and when these combine, genetic recombination is possible, allowing further variation in your genome, and variation is the stuff of evolution. So sexual reproduction is a key to allowing variation, which allows evolution by natural selection. Was that pretty much? Uh, I would say that was definitely begging the question. That explains that once it works, it's, it's useful and it works good, but it doesn't explain how it got to be that way uh, at all. How do you go from asexual to sexual reproduction? There is no good answer to that by evolution. Uh, you, it, sexual reproduction is, of course, a very inefficient way to produce offspring. Uh, the chances of how many things would have to be right in order for sexual reproduction to work? It would be like your automobile. I could say, how many things have to be right for it to work? You would say, well, thousands. How many things have to be wrong for it not to work? Any one of thousands of things. And sexual reproduction is so complex, it could not have arisen piece by piece uh, by chance. It had to be designed and created. Um, and there is no good evolutionary explanation. All the different single-celled animals have both types, asexual and sexual reproduction. And um, the idea that to, to say that it's here, therefore it must have evolved, is certainly begging the question. Yes, I agree it's here, but that to me says it must have been created. So again, both are going to use that evidence. Uh, I think the creation, though it does involve an unseen creator, definitely takes a lot of faith. And evolution would take even more faith to say, well, it works, so it had to, it had to get here somehow. Then I guess my next question for you uh, to begin with, why isn't the ocean floor as old as predicted? The formula distance equals rate, by rate times time says so. Why isn't the ocean floor as old as predicted? The formula distance equals rate times time says so. You can pass on these if you wish. Yeah, I don't think that question is put together the way the person was uh, intending it to be. The, the sediments in the ocean definitely indicate a young age for the ocean. There's not enough sediment down there to indicate millions of years of accumulation. That's why the continental drift theory is so important to the evolutionary theory, because they have to develop some way of getting rid of ocean sediments, because it simply is not there. Uh, I live by the San Andreas Fault. I'm very familiar with the continental cracks in the, the place, and the Earth is shifting and twisting. But again, that does not prove it's been going on for millions of years. And similarities of shapes, Africa and South America would fit together. That does not prove they broke apart millions of years ago. I could say this building and the building across the street are oriented the same. That does not prove they broke apart and the blacktop oozed up between them. It, uh, similarity of shape is determined by the uh, water level. If you raise the ocean 500 feet, Chicago becomes on the beach and uh, the whole Amazon jungle would be flooded and that similarity of shape would disappear. So the ocean sediments are a real problem for the evolutionist. 
As far as the continent spreading, it may be that the Atlantic is getting wider. The only uh, research that I'm familiar with that was done on that was the uh, satellite where they bounced lasers from Europe and America for eight years till the satellite finally fell out of parking orbit. They did not actually see any movement of the continents, so they attributed the maximum allowable error to atmospheric twinkle, 0.46 arc seconds as the laser goes through the atmosphere, and said, well, they must have moved and we couldn't detect it. So uh, there may be movement. I'm not saying there's not. But the idea of continental drift and ocean floors is, is very important to evolution because it gets rid of an embarrassing problem because there is not enough ocean sediments. As a creationist, I have no problem with that. The oceans are not billions of years old. That's why the sediment's not very thick. Thank you. Dr. Richardson. Well, I can account for an absence of sediments in the ocean by the theory of continental drift. Which is? Which is that the continents float on tectonic plates and that the, the continent of North America is drifting closer to the continent of Asia. At the Atlantic Ocean is spreading. We see seafloor spreading in the, the Atlantic Ocean. Seafloor spreading is accompanied by volcanic activity. Things we can just go down and look at. We, it, it's not real elaborate bouncing satellites or anything. We just measure distances. And we see seafloor spreading in the Atlantic Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is considered much more ancient. It's the ocean that surrounded Pangaea 200 million years ago when the continents formed the supercontinent. And the Pacific Ocean is shrinking as we drift closer to Asia. This used to be scary before uh, we made up with Russia. The thought that we were drifting towards Russia every year was, was scary to some people, but now we don't have a problem with that. Okay. The next one for you, then, I believe you're here. So um, uh, it, I, I think environmentalism is, is uh, valuable. I, th I think it goes overboard, and I think the many evolutionists are involved in environmentalism as kind of a salve on the conscience for the fact that they don't have the right God to worship. Again, we have three or four that, that are similar, so I'm going to, to try to question them. And I believe this is directed only at Dr. Hoven because it has to do with the handout that he gave out at the beginning. How are the theories of humanism, racism, pornography, and women's lib, etc., connected to evolution as is suggested in the handout given at the door? Question number six. All right, well, let me get to that one. The idea that there is no supreme being, that man is the god of this universe, that we make our own decisions based on what we feel is right and wrong as a human species, the idea that uh, there is no supreme being to be accounted to has given rise to numbers of offshoot religions. Hitler certainly used evolution to justify his genocide and racism. I have Hitler's list. He had the Jews at the bottom as more ape-like. They hadn't evolved as far. The blacks were next. Hitler hated the blacks. He walked out of the Olympics in 1936 when Jesse Owens won the Olympics, a black man. Uh, racism can certainly be traced uh, to the philosophy that different races of people are s superior to other races. Whereas in Christianity and the Bible, it teaches all nations are of one blood. Acts chapter 17 teaches that very plainly, uh, certainly against racism. Um, uh, what, uh, let's see, what, what, what you wanted communism. Uh, Karl Marx, of course, after Darwin's book came out, just rejoiced and said, this is perfect to justify my theories of communism. Karl Marx tried to dedicate his book, Das Kapital, to Charles Darwin. Marx knew full well the importance of evolution on communism, and without evolution, communism would collapse. They have to have evolution to support their theory, uh, their economic theories and political theories of communism. As far as how it ties in with abortion, uh, the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny back to the same question. Is the baby human at the moment of conception? It has 46 chromosomes. It is going to develop into a human without intervention. Would we be upset if a woman killed her baby six weeks after it was born? It's after all, it's her life. It's her body. Doesn't she have a choice anymore if it's going to interfere with her lifestyle? Uh, somebody's not thinking on this argument. As far as socialism, the idea that it's man's duty to take from the rich and give to the poor, the Robin Hood philosophy. Everybody should work together and we should make people, um, make people contribute to those who do not work or will not work or cannot work. Uh, socialism uh, ties right in with many of the philosophers of the 1800s who were avid evolutionists, including many in the United States. Uh, which other ones did they ask about on there? 
women's lib? Uh, let me, yeah, there, uh, blah, 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 blah. We talk about, oh dear, where is it here? Well, that's okay. Well, I'll read you a, a similar one okay. also then that had to do with, with, with question number six. No, I'm sorry, I can't really find it. Well, it had to do with, with uh, there, there was a, a similar question that I cannot find right now that had something to do with why is it that, that, well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to try to paraphrase something I can't read. Okay. Let on me on find it. Uh, that's fine. On the women's lib issue, I would say uh, what I'm referring to there is the, the type of extreme um, feminazis that R Rush Limbaugh talks about. Um, I certainly do not believe that man has the right to carry a club and drag his wife around by the hair, and that is certainly not taught in scripture. Uh, the wife uh, is my wife of nearly 20 years now, is my friend and my companion. We have a wonderful relationship. Um, there is uh, a difference in roles. If I was to ask which is better, a horse or a cow, you can't answer. They're different. I'm sorry. You know, one's not better than the other. Are you going to milk it or ride it? You know, there's a difference. So. Man and woman are different. According to scripture, they fill different roles. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with that. And the idea of trying to make them equal, of, of course, physically they're not equal. I mean, ask any biologist or go visit your doctor. There is a difference, you know. Uh, in the army, the, you test all the women, test all the men. The men are physically stronger. They can do more. They can carry a heavier, back, heavier backpack for longer. And uh, there are emotional differences. And I love all the differences. I think it's great. It's wonderful. And God did a great job. But uh, I'm against uh, the... Uh, extreme feminazi movement is the best way to put it. Uh, the idea of the women's lib as, in my understanding, that, um, and I think most women are also against it. Since this was a question directed at Dr. Holman, do you wish to reply? Uh, I wish to reply to his, his tone, if I may. Um, I will ask that you be a little bit cautious and stay to yeah. the points. Yes, my, my point is that, uh, again, I keep my religion separate from my science, but that is not to call me a religious. And my family is deeply religious. We have many ministers amongst us, and I resent the implication that evolution is a godless science. Evolution is a mechanism to explain what we observe. It does not deal with our faith. It does say that we cannot accept a literal, a, a literal interpretation of the Bible. Very few religions today accept a literal interpretation of the Bible. I, I do not wish to be excluded, therefore, from uh, religion because I also have another part of my life that observes what I can observe and uses reason, which I believe is a, a very fine human gift. Okay. You're first, I believe, Dr. Richardson. I'm going to go, I believe, through three more rounds and then we'll call it an evening. Annual plants. How many years to produce a seed that will replace the parent plant? And how did the eye become? Did it evolve by a cell committee to an order that effectively sees? I believe these are challenges to some things that may have been said earlier. Annual plants. How, how many years to produce a seed that will replace the parent plant, according to evolution? An annual plant is a plant that reproduces annually. It produces many seeds on each parent. Those seeds replace the parent. I don't, I don't quite know beyond that what the significance of replacing the parent is. Okay, genetically, maybe. Genetically, each seed receives half of the parent's genotype, so two seeds equals the genotype of the parent. So you're saying one generation? Sure. Okay. If you have 100 seeds, you more than replace yourself, so. Okay, Doc, well, the second half of that, how did the I become? 
Uh, let me phrase that. How did the capital I, capital become, <laughs> evolved by a cell committee to an order that effectively capital C's? I'm trying to reproduce the, the, what I think is the tone of the people's question. Right, right, but it's in capitals. How do we get an eyeball that can see? If, if you don't want to handle this, I've given this lecture many times. I'll be glad to. It takes an hour and I have 15 slides. <laughs> if, if you'd like to address the, the evolution of the eye, I'd be happy to let you in. Hi. I'm sorry. I was unfairly being facetious. Dr. Holman. I, I saw this question on the handout, um, so I, I know that it's a, a nice question to... Uh, pass up here apparently, but... Excuse me, Dr. Holman, your turn. Well, I would say it's obvious the eye could not evolve. Um, it had to be created. It's too complex. There's just too much there. Charles Darwin himself said the thing that caused him to shudder was the human eye. He said, I see no way it could evolve bit by bit. What good is a 5% eyeball? If it doesn't work yet, it's of no value. Uh, it's a hindrance. It's just like a, a, a reptile's limb evolving into a bird's wing it becomes a useless leg a long time before it becomes a useful wing and the critter gets killed because he can't run as fast so evolution stops dead in its tracks it, it, do, it doesn't work most things don't work bit by bit uh, tires on your vehicle don't work one at a time they all four have to be there for it to roll um, and the human eye with its uh, billions of complex parts it had to be created and designed just like a computer program you can spill coke in your keyboard and you will not develop a computer program. Uh, random chance produces chaos, disasters. It never produces more order. And the human eye is so ordered that makes me marvel at the intelligent creator. I have no problem with that. And I want to apologize as far as the tone. I certainly don't, uh, don't want to be offensive. I want to, this is a serious subject, extremely serious, because your behavior is determined by your beliefs. And we are watching a rapid decline in American culture and morals, I think, largely due to the teaching of evolution. I'm dead set against it. Okay, I'm going to, to read one that, and then paraphrase a little bit four others, or three others that I have in my hand here that ask similar questions. The theory of evolution is based on interpretation of physical evidence, while the creation theory seems to be based on attacking unanswered or controversial issues of evolution. What concrete physical evidence support creation science? A similar question made a comment that the Bible theory just doesn't cut it. And a series of questions also have to do with how do you reconcile what you are saying with the literal uh, description of creation in Genesis. There are a number here that, that have to do where the dinosaurs created on the fifth day, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We need about six more hours on that one. Uh, as far as the physical evidence for creation, again, we're talking evidence is not proofs. Uh, if I could demonstrate the world was not billions of years old because the Earth is slowing down a thousandth of a second per day, Every two and a half years, we have leap second. Read Astronomy Magazine, June 30th, 1992. We had leap second. The Earth is slowing down. Well, that means that it used to be spinning faster, obviously. And if you go backwards in time, only 10 million years, the Earth was spinning too fast for life to be here because the winds were 5,000 miles an hour from the Coriolis effect. And if you want to tell me the dinosaurs lived 70 million years ago, well, then we got a real problem because they'd have been blown off the surface of the Earth just by the, the, the rotational velocity is decreasing. Uh, the sun is shrinking, the moon is getting further away, the earth is cooling down, Jupiter, Saturn are all cooling down. I could go for days on physical evidences that the earth isn't billions of years old, which of course does not prove creation, but it takes away the option of evolution. What evolution has done in the schools in the last 15 or 20 years in the textbooks, and I speak to, I had lunch yesterday with a uh, school board member in my county, uh, and I'm very active in trying to get evolution out of the textbooks on the grounds that it is just a religion. I don't think they should teach evolution or creation in the textbooks. But what the evolutionists have done is they've used the, a, a very faulty logic. Um, they're saying, well, we don't know for sure how it happened, but this is the best option. That's like saying if a person is accused of a crime, he's brought to court, and he can prove an alibi. Judge, I didn't do that crime. I wasn't there. The judge says, well, okay, but you're still guilty until you prove who did it. 
the innocent party doesn't have to prove who did the crime. He just has to prove he didn't do it. And proving evolution did not happen and cannot happen and does not happen is sufficient. I don't need to be able to prove creation. It is easy to disprove evolution, and that's the real problem is the, the subject of origins cannot be discussed without religious implications. Okay, I, I believe the question is more what is the evidence other than the Bible? The evidence not against evolution, okay. but for creation. The evidence for creation is the complexity of life. It doesn't arise by chance. Uh, if a, an explosion in a print factory does not produce a book. It's too complex. And an ex a random variation in chance will never produce anything like we see the complexity of life. So the, the, the example of the watch. The, I've never been to Japan. I've not seen the Japanese watchmakers, but there's one over there someplace. Here, it's too complex to have arisen by chance. And the, everything in biology is too complex to have arisen by chance. One paramecium is more complicated than the space shuttle, by far. To say it evolved is to greatly oversimplify the complexity of all biology that we understand. So I would have to stand and say, hey, here's the watch. There has to be a watchmaker, though I've never seen him. I would say, here's the creation. There had to be a creator. Uh, that's just that simple. I agree. That's going into the metaphysical. I've not seen him. I've, you know, I've not touched him. So, okay. I'm going to follow that up then with the the, the last of the questions. And again, this is more directed toward you. Okay. And we have a number here that ask the same thing. That that have to do with with the complexity of the human, as you just discussed, and all. How does that rule out that? In effect, evolution is the mechanism by which God has created us. Yes. Um, and again, we we'll go back to who, who do you think God is? What kind of God are you worshiping? Is it a God of random chance that doesn't know what he wants? Or is it a God that knows what he wants? Uh, I'm sure the people in Japan did not throw the pieces in a dryer and let them clang around for a thousand years and hope it developed a Casio data bank watch. I think it, they had a design in mind when they went into it. And there is obvious design in the body, obvious design in everything in nature. And that speaks loudly of a very intelligent designer. Did I get off the question? How does it? Was the one about the Bible and where the dinosaurs fit in, or is that different? That was on that question, too, wasn't that it? That was on an earlier round, I believe. It was on the first half of that question. The, 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 the summary of all of these is, is, I think, comes back to a question we asked earlier that, that I tried to summarize. Is it possible that evolution is the mechanism God uses? I would say it is not possible that evolution is the mechanism God uses. By evolution, we need to carefully define the term. If there, there, there are two very different things that are classed under the term of evolution. There is simple variation. Dogs developing new varieties of dogs, and they will say, hey, that's evolution. No, no. That's variation. That happens. Florida rabbits cannot breed with Alaska rabbits. They have delineated the species, and they are no longer interfertile. They can't produce a viable offspring. Alaska rabbits can breed with Iowa rabbits, and Iowa rabbits can breed with Florida rabbits, but the two extremes cannot. They have diversified. I, I, I understand all that. But that's not evolution. That's variation. They're still rabbits. It didn't change into a hamster or anything else. It's still a rabbit. So that's not evolution. There is, there is no evidence for evolution ever having occurred unless you want to take evidences for variation. So what they do, it, some people call that microevolution and then macroevolution. The same phenomena could be observed with the weather. We have our daily weather patterns due to a number of forces, but our yearly weather patterns are due to other forces, solar forces outside of this Earth, you know, not related to the heating and cooling. Two totally separate set of events that cause the weather patterns. And we have microevolution, variation, which is God-ordained. Uh, he created the species with the genetic code that's very complex. My three kids are all very different. Um, that's proof of creation. Uh, you can buy cars with a variety of options. You know, that's proof of creation. Somebody okay, designed Dr. It. Richardson, is it possible to you that evolution is the mechanism that God has used for creating the human? Yes. Okay. Is that all you wish to say? Uh, I would like to say that um, that I noticed that microevolution is now acceptable, and microevolution is just evolution at a smaller scale. If we accept microevolution, again, remember that the mechanism of evolution is natural. One mechanism of ev evolution is natural selection. Other mechanisms of evolution are genetic drift. Uh, other genetic 
mechanisms. If we accept microevolution, if we accept the mechanism of evolution of natural selection, and we uh, then it, it is not a conceptual leap to go from that to macroevolution or the evolution of types. Okay, I'm going to finish up with a question that I certainly hope was written facetiously. <coughs> Please don't answer this, or maybe you can if you wish. To the evolutionist, the National Enquirer, Enquirer at the grocery store regularly shows a half dog plus half humans and other half and half species. Is this part of your empirical proof that proves evolution? Do you wish to discuss the National Enquirer? If uh, you don't, we can call it an evening, unless Dr. Hovland wishes to discuss the National Enquirer. The National Enquirer is an important part of many biology general examinations. <laughs> so, <laughs> Those of you that have her in a class, remember that. Uh, I don't think I've ever read a National Enquirer. I don't, uh, I certainly don't learn any, or, you know, study that at all or uh, that kind of stuff. No, that kind of stuff. And, but it is a good point, you know. There, there are no intermediates today. That any breeder, any cattle breeder or dog breeder will tell you there are limits to the genetic drift. And the further you get from the norm, the more problems you develop. So, yeah, Christians and creationists, maybe the two aren't the same, but the creationists don't question genetic drift, but there are limits to it. We don't question variation, but there are limits. For years, they've been trying to breed faster horses. Why doesn't somebody breed wings onto one? They could certainly be faster then. You, you're never going to do it. There are limits to that. Uh, it cannot be done. And so what has happened is taking microevolution and interpreting that to prove macroevolution is a gigantic leap of faith. I hope you've enjoyed this debate on creation and evolution. If you have any questions or things we left unanswered, don't hesitate to give us a call. More importantly, though, is to make sure you're going to heaven. We're all going to die one of these days, and you're going to be dead for a long time. You better make sure you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and have your sins forgiven. See, I'm a sinner, and I deserve to go to hell, but the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, was applied to my account. February 9, 1969, I asked God to forgive me and save me, and the righteousness of Christ was put on my account. So it looks to God like I'm perfect. Well, I know I'm not, and my wife certainly knows I'm not, but God thinks I am. Because when he looks at me, he sees the blood of Christ applied to my sin, and so I'm forgiven. And you can have the same thing. If you'll pray and say, Lord, I'm a sinner, would you please forgive me? He'll save you. He promised he would in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. All you need to do is ask him, and he'll forgive your sin. The Bible says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repent means to turn. You turn from your sin and turn to God. God needs to see a change in your heart and in your attitude where you say, Lord, I don't want to do these bad things anymore. Now, that doesn't mean you won't sin again, but something's changed in your heart where you don't want to. You want to live for God. And then it's a matter of, once you receive Christ, it's a matter of growing, reading your Bible, going to church and praying and telling other people. Those things help you to grow, to be a strong, mature son of God. Boy, please call us or write us if we can be any help. I'm normal in the office Thursdays and Fridays and always take phone calls. I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. Thanks so much for joining us. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hovind's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? 
And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals like the longevity chart which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. Drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. Dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson. Captivate everyone from age four to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503. Or call us at 850-479-3466. Or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.